Hello, good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm Chris Reisenman, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. Welcome to the first of three civics classes brought to you by the Sonoma County League. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights, encourage informed and active participation in government, and ensure that everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through education and advocacy at all levels of government. I encourage you to join a local league near you to further the cause of democracy in our nation. As I mentioned, this civics class is the first in a series of three. The next class is on Tuesday, February 20th at 6 p.m., again on Zoom. It's about how an idea becomes a law. Who can make a law? Is it easy, hard? How are differences of opinion handled in making laws? This is a very important class for your understanding of representative democracy, and we guarantee it won't be boring. If you haven't already, please sign up at lwvsonoma.org. The final class in the series will be on Tuesday, March 12th at 6 p.m., again on Zoom. And it will be about city and county government. Most people are aware of what happens at the federal level, but fewer people are aware of what happens locally in their city and county. And yet the local level is the real center core heartbeat of democracy. All democracy begins with us, and it starts at the local level. If you are thinking of skipping this class, don't. You'll really be glad you took it. And again, please sign up on lwvsonoma.org. Today's class is about California state government and will be presented by Dr. David McEwen, a well-known commentator and respected political science professor at Sonoma State University. Dr. McEwen has been on faculty at SSU since 2003, where he teaches courses in both international and national politics, international security and terrorism, state and local politics, campaigns and elections, and political behavior. In addition to his work at SSU, he has taught at UC Berkeley and Stanford University. He earned his PhD from UC Irvine and has studied in Virginia, Washington, DC, Israel, West Bank, and in Europe. He was a Fulbright teaching scholar in 2009 and 10, working in the Department of International Relations and European Studies at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. He has worked with CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, and NPR, the Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, and the LA Times, just to name a few. We are privileged to have him speaking uh, with us this evening. Okay, and now for some housekeeping. Dr. Mc After Dr. McEwen speaks, we'll open up for questions and answers. You may use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions. Our question moderator, Karen Weeks, will ask as many questions as time permits. As always, we ask that you will be respectful and adhere to civil discourse in your questions. And now, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. David McEwen. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. I hope that you can uh, see my screen there. We should be uh, good to go, I hope. Does that work there? Someone can give me a shout out that uh, you can see the screen okay there. Is that good? We can We're see good. you should possibly right. put it in uh, slideshow mode. Uh, I will. I will. I'm just moving, moving everything around here. Hold on one second. All right, there we go. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it is a pleasure. I hope uh, that you'll learn some things. Uh, we'll prompt some thinking. Uh, this is a, a, a tall order uh, and in keeping with the Kind of function of the league and the, the great work that they do I, I think all of you are up to that task in terms of thinking about how california state government works some things to pay attention to there are lots of different ways that we could do this we could pay attention to uh you know the three branches uh, we could talk about who does what i want to give you more than that uh tonight i want to give you some things to consider uh, about uh, kind of byways and informal ways to influence policy, some places where you have moments based upon what's passionate to you. 
uh, in terms of spending a Tuesday night to learn about uh, civics and government in California, some places where you can uh, put in your influence and your voice and where are the best places to do that and how to do that. So we're gonna concentrate on a couple of elements. I'll go through those at the front. Uh, and I also wanna step back and provide for you a series of links. So there will be a, a, ser a series of uh, URLs, web pages, links, if you will, resources that all work uh, with the fantastic uh, crew of the uh, League of Women Voters in Sonoma County to get that to you as well after this. So uh, you can take pictures, you can you know write furi uh, furiously uh, on the different elements, but know that a lot of the slides and uh, information presented here have hyperlinks, you're going to get those. So you'll be able to access uh, the information that we have here. We want to make sure and get that in your hands. In addition, I will go for a period of time. Uh, as was mentioned in the intro, we will have time for uh, a Q&A. We'll leave plenty of time for that. I would anticipate that we'll go until sometime around 7 or 7.05 so that we can wrap up and, and get to uh, you know 20 minutes or so of your questions uh, before we end the evening. Uh, so uh, again, thank you all for joining us. I want to give, uh, again, a shout out to my uh, great friends at the League of Women Voters of Sonoma County. They do fantastic work, uh, and I always enjoy working with them uh, and appreciate the conscientious uh, uh, work uh, efforts, uh, really the heavy lift that we have to kind of elevate the conversation uh, around politics and policy at a time that's uh, hugely uh, contentious and difficult to do just that. And so I'm a, a huge proponent of the work that this league and all the leagues do uh, across the country and especially here in the North Bay. Uh, as a reminder, I was said at the beginning, uh, these are the uh, different classes that are coming up, obviously tonight. Uh, and then uh, Logan Pitts, uh, SSU alum and former political science student of ours, uh, will talk about how an idea becomes law. And uh, our, our great uh, colleague uh, of mine, uh, Steve Rabinowitz, uh, who's been involved in the city of Santa Rosa and at the JC for some time, will talk in March about how county and city government works. Uh, there's the link as well uh, for the league. And so I encourage you to sign up, sign up for these classes classes because I think they also provide you with an important opportunity and additional information about how to influence policy, what to do with uh, uh, those things that are passionate uh, that you feel should have uh, uh, see the light of day or get a better hearing, if you will, uh, in Sacramento and in Santa Rosa or wherever you may live. So our charge tonight is, is uh, before us. Uh, how does California state government matter? How much do you know about it? What should we know about it? What does our California state government what does it do? Where are elements to understand places we can have influence? Uh, how do we find out even who our state representatives are? Uh, and then we really want to dive into who matters, what matters, when it matters, why it matters, and how it matters. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is there's been dramatic leadership change in both the Assembly and the State Senate in Sacramento. Uh, as uh, most of you uh, know, uh, Mike McGuire from Healdsburg is now the Senate pro tem. Uh, Jim Wood is the uh, uh, Speaker pro tem, uh, just uh, the second position in, in the State Assembly. Uh, Cecilia Aguiar Curry uh, is a, an important majority leader in the California Assembly. And Bill Dodd, uh, Senator, State Senator Dodd, is an important uh, actor, if you will, in terms of what is happening on governmental organization. Uh, then you think about, uh, you know, Damon Connolly, even though he's new uh, to the state assembly, he's someone who brings uh, long uh, years of, of experience at the local level as a county supervisor. So the North Bay uh, really is, uh, it, it, it holds its own and uh, plays above its weight uh, in the state legislature. And that's an important element of what we're going to talk about tonight as well. So we want to dig deeper to look at uh, your involvement, these influences, and with these leadership changes, places where uh, we can really uh, make a change and uh, do things that are important uh, in our communities when we think about Sacramento and what's happening there. So right out of the gate, it's always helpful uh, when these talks to kind of define uh, politics and what we're thinking about in terms of politics. Politics can be defined a lot of different ways, but we're gonna have a very simple, straightforward definition. It's the authoritative allocation of values. Uh, the authoritative allocation of values means, for example, that budgets matter a lot. Uh, you, if you want to know what a politician, what she believes, what he believes, what their priorities are, you look at budgets because budgets tell us how they order uh, their priorities. So politics as the authoritative allocation of values, as, as who gets the spoils, who gets what, when, where, why, politics as that allocation of values really clashes or uh, is most apparent with budgets. 
So there's certain variables that matter with this, but I just want to start right at the top by thinking about politics, thinking about what variables matter. We'll talk about those in the next slide and then kind of give you a layout of what we're going to do. We're going to look at the three streams of California government and how these three streams influence across the branches, policy making and politics. We're going to look at the California legislature, take the traditional lawmaking process, kind of toss that out and think about where there are moments or points in the legislative process, in the lawmaking process where you can make a difference. We're going to look at the unorthodox system of direct legislation or direct democracy in California and then end with the rulemaking system in California governance, which is a hugely important for those of you that are subject matter experts in certain areas or in emerging areas, like for example, AI, artificial intelligence, or what's related to transparency and disclosure and government at the local level or even up to the state level. And then kind of pan back from all of that and end with thinking about trends and developments that will affect governance and politics in the Golden State moving forward and how that matters. And then obviously take your comments, questions, and concerns as a result. So that's kind of the layout for tonight. Again, politics is the authoritative allocation of values, the dividing of the spoils, if you want to think of it that way. And therefore, certain variables matter. And there are three fundamental variables that matter greatly in California politics. One of those variables is fiscal stress. We're asking the public space, we're asking the government to do a lot for all of us all the time whether we're thinking about Santa Rosa or Sonoma County, or whether we're thinking about Sacramento or the differences between uh, the Northern California and Southern California. But this perennial condition of fiscal stress is something that plagues California well before Proposition 13 uh, and has been certainly an apparent uh, kind of affect of our politics after Proposition 13. And the, the politics of budgets and fiscal stress are framed by the notion of uncertainty or the variable of uncertainty. If you make the wrong choice in policy, you make the wrong choice in politics, uh, this uncertain world can lead to unintended or intended consequences. It can lead to things uh, that happen afterwards that we might not have been able to uh, forecast or think about. And certainly in the age of COVID, the pandemic, economic stress, uh, economic slowdown, or just the tenor of our politics today, that this variable of uncertainty is all around us all the time. What will happen in November? What will happen on March 5th? What happens next year? What happens moving forward? It allows us by paying attention to the variable of uncertainty to think about over the horizon and forecast what will happen down the road. We combine this with that first variable of fiscal stress and budgets, and it allows us to pay close attention to that authoritative allocation of values. And then you want to make the right choice. And this is where the variable of discretion comes in. Do you know or how uh, you pick this person over that person? And by making that discrete choice, you are making a choice for judgment. Who has the better judgment? And how do you make that kind of uh, assessment, uh, especially around complex public policy or issues that might deal with poverty or homelessness or problems that have plagued us uh, not just locally or statewide, but affect our national political scene as well? So we want these three fundamental variables to be kind of in the back of our mind if we pay attention to this. And then since I'm a political scientist and someone who's worked in the political world, you cannot forget about the relevance of the variable of timing and how timing matters greatly in politics, whether that's timing around a, a crisis, uh, an event that happens, uh, bad weather or storms or global climate change, or whether it's uh, timing related to what happens in the calendar uh, that, that affects a certain rulemaking or certain bills or certainly things that move forward in the legislative process or not. So timing is a big variable that affects all three of these components of fiscal stress, uncertainty, and discretion. So with that kind of setup, let's dive right into uh, a couple of elements here related to California politics and California governance. <clears throat> right? First, remember that the California Constitution is huge. It's expansive. And if you look at the first California constitution, we link to that in there, or you look at the rewritten early constitution that's uh, composed 30 years later, or even today's constitution, the California constitution is expansive. It's large. You can measure it by the number of words uh, that's in the constitution, and it's a top seven constitution in the world. You can measure it by the number of pages or just everything that it covers. It's all in there. Uh, in the California Constitution. And then there's an additional notion 
in this expansive constitution. California is but one of 15 states that has all three special powers of initiative, recall, and referendum. We see the initiative process in 26 states and the District of Columbia, but we don't see all three of these components except in 15 states, most notably in the West, Western part of the United States and in Massachusetts. But this process, this special set of powers of initiative, recall, and referendum are also hugely important in the California governance process. And we don't want to forget those and part of that expansive state constitution. You can look at, uh, as one of the links uh, provided here, all the things that are in the expansive uh, constitution, uh, you know, the state dance, the state rock, the different symbols and emblems, all the laws that are in there. Uh, some of them are humorous. Uh, some of them are quite serious uh, and ever evolving. But it's just important to remember that the California constitution by design uh, has been one that has been uh, expansive, large, and ever expanding and will continue to do so uh, moving forward. So it's just a, a fun element it will, uh, of, of our state and an important notion. You have to look to like the great nation of India or uh, the great state of Louisiana to see really comparable size and weight and importance of a constitution. And obviously the great nation of India and uh, the great state of Louisiana, based on the French legal tradition, all dramatically different than what we see here in California. So it really is a state that is uh, of its own, uh, something that no writers have noted over the years from Harry McWilliams as California as the great exception, or Joan Didion uh, reflecting on California as the symbol of the American dream and the American promise, uh, where the edge of the world ends at the Pacific Ocean and symbolizes everything that is possible, and, and also at the same time, the borders or ends uh, of that dream uh, at the same time. So California and its constitution has huge practical and symbolic value in that expansive constitutional framework. All right. So to start tonight, let's uh, kind of dive into thinking about politics and policy in California along three streams. These three streams are how things get on the agenda and how uh, we see policy output or implementation that, that results. So you have a, an idea formation stream or what's called the problem definition stream, how you define a problem. And if you think about our politics today in this state, you think about our politics across this nation, the problem definition stream, what the problem is, what it looks like at the border, uh, what it looks like with the powers of the president, what it looks like with uh, how we want to recall or what what's permitted uh, under a single subject rule for an initiative or not. All of that about problem definition is not uh, agreed upon. And so the ability to form an idea and frame that idea is an opportunity to put things on the agenda. And that obviously affects the policy setting or the policy making stream, what the rulemaking looks like for the bureaucracy, but also what the subject matter experts in the legislature pay attention to. So as you define a problem or develop an idea, you have to think about how it collides with the policy making stream. And that's obviously framed at the bottom, as noted here, by the political stream. And that that, that political uh, stream uh, obviously plays a huge, huge uh, component here in terms of, of what we're doing and what we're trying to pay attention to. Next, uh, we want to pay attention to, whoops, hold on one second. Let me, let me stop the share here just for a second. I want to put out this qu question there just for a second. I'll come back to that. Bear with me just for a second. We also want to pay uh, very close attention uh, to the calendar uh, and, and what we think of as the idea stream here for the calendar. We can think about how many days until the general election, but look, uh, this is the league and a league presentation. So there are only 14 days left to register to vote. So we want to make that uh, a, a huge paramount importance. And there's only 28 days really until that 2024 primary election uh, here, held here uh, in early March, on March 5th. In other words, Super Tuesday is right around the corner. And as you know, ballots arrive. Uh, in mailboxes uh, this week. So uh, the calendar idea or the calendar stream is an important element and paying attention to deadlines and what's happening, as you'll see when we look at the legislative process, is also uh, another important component here of this policy stream, political stream, and policy idea or formation stream to create things getting on the agenda. Now, uh, as we do this and, and look at this, uh, we also want to pay attention to the California legislature. So as we move from kind of setting up the policy streams, 
want to kind of dive into the primary branch, and that's the California legislature. So to do this, we want to pay attention to a couple of things. First, let's define the environment and landscape today and what we've seen in the recent past. Let's examine this new leadership and why it's important, key committees and the gatekeepers that are involved, and then what to do, what to think of, or how to influence this process with this new leadership, with these key committees and these gatekeepers and what we can do, and how do we track bills or legislation, and how do we do that without paying uh, for that service, and what key dates and elements uh, should we pay attention to as a result. If you think just about the environment of the modern California legislature, you want to kind of divide this a kind of along three lines. First is the modern California legislature, the full-time legislature, is created by Proposition 1A in 1966. Uh, some of you uh, may, uh, the historians in the bunch may recall, right, Proposition 1A, 1966, this is the year Ronald Reagan is elected governor of California. Uh, this is the year that uh, Jess Unruh, Big Daddy Jess Unruh, pushes forward Proposition 1A to create a full-time staff with a uh, full-time legislature, full-time legislators, full-time staff in a state that had full-time problems was the argument, and that all of these, this full-time attention was needed to deal with what was moving forward in California at that time. And the California legislature moves through fits and starts, at least through 1974. That's the election uh, that occurs just after Watergate and the first election where Jerry Brown comes to play and is elected Secretary of State. But, the, but that legislature that's created, that full-time legislature that's created in 1966, takes office in 67 is really virtually the same until term limits movement hits and takes starts to take effect by 1994. The attempt to change the legislature because of the frustration that the minority party had uh, with Willie Brown uh, to be uh, quite candid at that time and remained in a status or a state until about 2012 when we also changed uh, term limits to what it is today. The reason that that's important is from 2024 to 2026, so this election cycle into the next election cycle, by the end of 2026, 52%, more than half of the California legislature will be termed out. And that means there's a lot of churning under the surface based upon what's happened in terms of demographic change, in terms of political partisanship and party change that are also driving what's going on in the legislature. So the legislature today, the legislature in, 20, in January 2027, is going to look very different than the legislature that we saw just say 12 years ago, or the legislature that we saw in 2003 when Gray Davis is tossed out in the recall and Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, becomes California gov California's governor. And since that time, since about 2003, as you're going to see when we look at party registration elements, California has become not just a democratic state and a blue state, it's become a deeply blue state, even though there are places and elements where Donald Trump has carried counties and there are elements of red, but there are also elements of purple. So there's something unusual here that is affecting the legislative process that involves California government, reflects at some level that super democratic majority, that rise of democratic party registration, but also sees with about one in four voters who are registered as Republicans and just over 20%, about one in five that are registered as no party preference voters. So as we think about the legislature and where it's come since big daddy Jess Unruh uh, and Ronald Reagan helped push Prop 1A over the, over the line back in 1966, a lot has changed uh, in terms of what the legislature looks like, who's there, uh, what's happened in the term limits era, all the while in the last 20 years or so in a state that's become much more deeply blue. Uh, California is also a state uh, that has experienced a recent turnover uh, in leadership, as you're going to see. Uh, obviously, uh, Mike McGuire coming into the pro tem seat, Robert Rivas coming into the assembly speaker seat, as well as those that are around them have uh, provided an opportunity uh, and a different change or focus for issues that are going to move forward, even uh, as we uh, move forward with uh, the second term of Governor Newsom, uh, who fends off a recall, uh, attempted recall in 2021, but then uh, is certainly looking uh, at other uh, elements that might be before him with that two-term uh, two limit uh, element that we see for California's governor. This means that there are key committees and gatekeepers, new roles for legislators uh, that we want to look at and how we influence that and how we track 
those bills and pay attention to those key dates. So this just kind of sets up the landscape, if you will, for the California legislature. This is typically what you see. This is the, the typical thing that's put out. This is by a housing uh, uh, interest group that looks at the, the California legislative process. And man, you look at this legislative process game uh, at the start and, and what you can do. It looks uh, you know, like a game that's going to take a lot longer than Monopoly and also a game that has certain kind of key elements or places uh, to pay attention to uh, in both the Senate and the Assembly uh, before a bill is actually uh, gets signed into law and becomes chaptered by the Secretary of State. But when you look at uh, uh, something like this, as busy as this is and as difficult it is, it doesn't really tell us about the key uh, shoals to pay attention to, the key rocks to navigate around, or what to think about in, in terms of uh, the legislative process itself. It goes through bit by bit, but it doesn't really capture what's going on. And then there are other interest groups that also participate and talk about the life cycle of legislation, concentrating on just one chamber. This is California Association of Counties uh, that is given to county supervisors to explain to them how the legislative process works. Again, not too helpful because the really key elements are those uh, black arrows that are in there, uh, and, and whether they're uh, large or small, it gives you the key uh, moments or inflection points, key places where you can influence what's going on, all the while paying attention to the rules. So whether, we look, we're, whether we're looking at uh, an advocacy group, like the, the Housing California Interest Group, or uh, the California uh, Association of Counties trying to educate county supervisors about legislation, in each case, it doesn't really capture how an idea how, how an idea becomes law or the key places, byways, the key informal points of how to move something along in the legislative process. So we want to dive into that just a little bit uh, tonight uh, as well. All right. Now, if you want to find out who your state assembly member is, who your state senator is, you can uh, follow this URL. You put in your address. You can put in the address of of uh, parents or a loved one, a sibling, whatever you would like, a friend, uh, and you can find out who their representative is as well. It will give you both your uh, state assembly member and your state senator, uh, always a helpful component to know who you're speaking with uh, and, and who, uh, who represents your interests. But then let's kind of look at this leadership component to pay attention. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here uh, on this slide. So if we look at California's legislative leadership and what's happened, right? We, we have not only the California Assembly with its 80 members and the California Senate with its 40 members, but you have that new speaker on the California side, uh, the California Assembly side, uh, Robert Rivas uh, down uh, in, in uh, the Salinas area, uh, who, who is someone who uh, represents a, a different way than what we've seen before. So understanding the background uh, of, the, of the speaker understanding where he came from and understand how he how he's different uh, from the previous speaker, Anthony Rendon, uh, is hugely important. Uh, speaker Rivas comes in after a bruising, brutal leadership fight uh, that, that occurred over a long period of time, uh, about a year, um, a little bit longer, uh, and, and involved a lot of bad blood uh, between a progressive speaker uh, and, and Anthony Rendon, a uh, Los Angeles-based, Orange County-based, uh, speaker Anthony Rendon, uh, who, who was uh, emboldened and did a lot of stuff uh, to grow interests of members who, whose voices hadn't been heard. And, and the new speaker comes in, Robert Rivas, and that new speaker who comes in uh, represents a, a, a different element of the Democratic Party, uh, a party that is uh, not as progressive, uh, and also a, a party that's trying to unite different wings that felt like they were out uh, of favor. Uh, under the previous speaker. So this provides understanding that political environment means that certain types of legislation uh, are gonna move forward uh, in the assembly that uh, weren't uh, evident before. And a key player in that is gonna be the speaker pro tem, the second in command, and that's Jim Wood, uh, Assembly Member Wood from the second district. Uh, he's leaving uh, the legislature. Uh, as many of you know, uh, there's a race to succeed him in the March 5th primary, but the, major, the, the speaker pro tem has a role over all committees. So he's involved in several committees as you're going to see on the next slide, but he sits basically over all committees and plays a role as uh, the speaker's right-hand man. He's also someone who raised a lot of money uh, for this new speaker. So he's very close to him. So you have a, a new speaker, 
you have uh, a, a North Bay assembly member uh, in Jim Wood, someone who was involved in healthcare, involved in wildfire protection, involved in a lot of issues related to uh, the rural nature of, of that district, who also is very close to the speaker and is helped by a new majority leader. And that new majority leader uh, is Cecilia Aguiar Curry, uh, the local uh, assemblywoman as well. Uh, she's played a huge role in moving legislation over the last year, kind of growing her uh, influence in the chamber. And that leadership team of Jim Wood helping the new speaker and Cecilia Aguiar Curry, also from the area as the majority leader, they work together with the whipping leader. And the whipping leader is the person who corrals votes. And that's Matt Haney, H-A-N-E-Y, from San Francisco. It is Haney combined with Curry combined with Jim Wood, who are counting the votes and controlling the action on the floor of the assembly of what goes on. So where they sit in the chamber, uh, what they're doing in the chamber, what they're watching in the chamber day to day, not just what's happening on the dais, not just what's happening up front, if you will, controlling the chamber, but what's happening on the floor and who gets to speak and when, all of that hugely influential because that triumvirate, those three are, are running the day to day uh, elements of the chamber and the assembly that we see going on when we go to visit and we're sitting up uh, above in the gallery watching what's happening. And what's interesting uh, about the seating arrangement is when you look at where the speaker sits and you look at uh, where the pro, uh, speaker pro tem sits, and the majority leader sits, they sit towards the back of the chamber when there there's access, if you will, uh, to, to uh, get involved or to do different things, to watch what's happening in the chamber and also to talk to staff uh, and others off the floor. So it's, it's a different type of arrangement and a very interesting arrangement in terms of what they're doing in terms of checking in with their membership. Then there's the Republican leader, uh, uh, James uh, Gallagher, and uh, the Republican leader uh, represents but 18 members. So if you look at the membership in the legislature there, and you look and see what's happening, you see that Democrats have a supermajority. They are as, not quite as high as they've ever been uh, historically. They uh, have been as high as 65, 66, right in that range. But they are pretty close to that historically high number and have a supermajority. That is both important in terms of the rules for passing legislation, but at the same time, it's also difficult to corral all of those cats. So when we look at this new leadership in the assembly and the size of the assembly, that means there are a lot of select committees. It means there are a lot of standing committees. It means that there's a lot going on outside the chamber itself. And to govern or manage what is happening on the floor requires careful choreography and a lot of signaling that goes on. You contrast that with the California Senate, right? 40 members, a very different environment, seen as the uh, upper house. And you see a new figure come in uh, after Tony Atkins down from San Diego, who's announced she's running for governor. You see Mike McGuire come in, uh, the, the person we all lovingly like to call the Energizer Bunny. But when you look at Mike McGuire uh, and you look at what he has done on the floor, he was uh, the majority leader who handled the whipping operation for Tony Atkins, the previous pro tem. So that means he, the, the majority leader, the, the whipping leader of votes, the person who is corralling votes and managing the floor is someone who's negotiating all the time with different elements of the Democratic and Republican caucuses, but a lot with the Democrats because Democrats have a supermajority. They have 32 of those 40 seats uh, in, in the state Senate, and they're likely to pick up a third seat uh, later this year. So what that means is you're likely to see 33 uh, of 40 members in the state Senate be Democrats, kind of reflecting the, the depth uh, of, of Democratic success up and down the ballot, uh, especially since 2003 and the recall of Gray Davis. Now, this new pro tem who was just seated yesterday has not named his majority leader, uh, hasn't created the whipping operation yet, but the people he will put around him will be absolute confidants. So looking to leadership and understanding who the speaker appoints as his number two, or is number three, or is number four, in terms of, say, speaker pro tem, majority leader, and whip leader, you do correspondingly the same thing on the California Senate side to see who does Mike McGuire put around him 
in that pro tem because he has to do a few things. He has to balance that herd of cats, those wide range of majority that he has on the Democratic side with 31 other members. He also has to balance North and South, elements of the party that are progressive, elements of the party that are uh, close to labor or close to business. And that means that key committee leaderships are a barometer or indicator of what is going on. For the Republican leader, that we see uh, going on, uh, Brian Jones uh, on the Senate side, uh, his job is to find careful points where he can play some influence in terms of what's going on. But because of the dual supermajorities that we see in the Assembly and the Senate, that alters uh, the dynamic of what's happening. And in the previous speakership of Anthony Rendon, he empowered deeply and independently his uh, key committee uh, leaders, committee chairpersons. You don't see that going on as much under the Rivas model, even early on here. So far, it's much more of a team effort that's coordinated from the top with that leadership team uh, of Rivas, Wood, Aguiar, Curry, uh, and Matt Haney. And as Mike McGuire develops his leadership team on the pro tem side, his majority leader who sits on budget, what happens in key committees, and someone who's an influential, like of an important committee, like governmental organization, Senator Bill Dodd, that would uh, they would play an important role in terms of the leadership team. So the dynamic that exists between who and how they're running things in the assembly is dramatically different on the Senate side. And even though they're all Democrats, they're not all copacetic in terms of what they're doing and moving forward. So you want to pay kind of close attention or elements to this uh, in, in terms of thinking of the importance of the California legislative leadership as it moves forward. You see things like this. This is from uh, the Courage California Institute. Uh, I've provided this as a link uh, at the end. Uh, this is a nice clean reference to what a California two-year legislative session looks like uh, and how bills move. And the reason I wanna point your uh, attention to it is right dead center in that house, whether you're looking at the state senator or the state Senate, state assembly, is the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee, and therefore the Appropriations Committee chair of that committee, the ranking member for the other side, the Republican side, and the members of the Appropriation Committee are huge power players for leadership. They are important actors in stopping things and, and letting things move forward because most bills that do something appropriate money. So the Appropriations Committee serves as a place of gatekeeping, of moving things forward or not, of killing things or not letting them uh, see the light of day. So the Appropriations Committee can serve as a proxy of what the legislative leadership believes. It's an important element to think about who's on there and what they're letting move forward and what they're letting not move forward. Are they uh, moving forward things related to healthcare or not? Are they moving things forward related to universal coverage or not? Are they putting forward pilot programs, testing programs? And what are they doing about say unemployment or education or job training or things that the governor has proposed uh, around mental health or those things being stopped? So we often look at bill authors and co-authors. We often look at what's introduced and concurrences, but it is the action past the committee hearing into the Appropriations Committee that serves as an important gatekeeping role here uh, in terms of, of what we want to pay attention to uh, for uh, California's legislative session, the two-year period uh, that occurs with the Assembly and the Senate. All right, so looking at some key committees, and you'll see some differences right off the bat for the California legislature. You see that the Assembly has 33 standing committees. Okay, you expect they would have more than the state Senate with that has 22. But when you start to look at select committees, wow, there sure are a lot of select committees in the assembly side. Uh, a select committee on wine, to be sure, a select committee on artificial intelligence, uh, a select committee uh, on X, Y, and Z uh, on the assembly side. And you see the same number of joint committees, you see special committees related to ethics, but it is really the subcommittees or the subcommittees of standing committees on the Senate side it's the subs that you wanna pay attention to. While standing committees play an important role, it is the budget or budget and fiscal review subs that serve to check and move forward legislation or not. And there is one special standing uh, subcommittee and that's the Los Angeles 
uh, San Diego, uh, Los, uh, Orange County uh, Transportation Subcommittee. But really, on the Senate side, it's budget and fiscal review subs, those five subcommittees that might deal with health care, education, transportation, job training, whatever it might be uh, in the budget and fiscal subs that are important. But if you look on the assembly side, you see seven budget subcommittees and something called JLAC, or the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, the Joint Legislative Audit Committee. And then you look at someone like the majority leader or the speaker pro tem, Jim Wood, Cecilia Aguiar Curry, and they play important roles as part of the leadership on the assembly side. This is the speaker pro tem and the majority leader, important leadership roles on the budget subcommittees and the Joint Legislative Audit Committee which can call for audits of state spending related to the Employment Development Department or uh, audits related to uh, whether students are getting to degree on time or what's happening around elections and election interference uh, at the county level as counties conduct elections, transportation, and so on. And we see similarly the budget and fiscal review subs on the Senate side as the leaders in those committees, those subcommittees, budget subs and budget and fiscal review subcommittees are key leaders within the leadership team about what's happening in the state budget and negotiating with the governor. So they're hugely important in terms of influencing policy and what even makes it to appropriations or what the parameters of spending looks like uh, across the whole budget. And obviously they're going to interact a lot uh, with, the, uh, with the executive, with the governor and his team in terms of what the governor's priorities are, what the trade-offs are and these types of things. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in the governor's budget proposal uh, that comes out uh, typically by the 10th of January, in the governor's budget proposal, there's about $314, $315 million that's typically doled out to members of the legislature for projects related uh, to, to things in their district, for things that they can do for Sonoma County or for Solano County or for Napa County or for Mendo and so on. And, and those might be for the counties themselves, or they may be for cities in those counties or for nonprofits in those uh, communities, all of that. That money is absent in the budget, uh, in the budget proposal that the governor released on January 10th. The absence of that means that the members of the budget subcommittees have to trade, have to horse trade certain things the governor wants with elements that they of projects they might want in their district something that their county or city uh, might want or uh, a, a, a worthwhile nonprofit project or even something that requires additional funding by the state to match federal funding uh, related to transportation or building or whatever could be going on. So in that, in that sense, uh, the trading that goes on out of the budgets, remember fiscal stress, uh, what's going on with uncertainty and what's going on with discretion are all elements that go on here and will be subject to what are called trailer bills or language that trails the budget after the budget is done uh, in January for July 1st. All of that takes place over the summer. So as you look at the California legislature and key committees, you wanna pay very close attention to the budget committees, the budget and fiscal review subcommittees and the leaders of those because they are working with leadership in concert with what the governor and other actors uh, would like to see out of the California budget process. Joint committees are, are, are committees that are held uh, across both. And in the element of, of those uh, joint committees, uh, it's important to pay attention to, uh, they're often uh, developed that lead to uh, certain key issues or elements that uh, might be studied from one legislative session to another and then kind of go away uh, at some level. All right, so here's an example of the California legislature seating chart. This is the state assembly seating chart. Uh, where certain members uh, exist. Uh, and, and as you can see, you have uh, uh, where the Democrats sit, uh, where the Republicans sit, uh, you have the dais in the front. And if you look kind of the back or at the bottom of the screen to what would be uh, seats kind of, uh, gosh, I guess it would be like uh, right near the back row. This is where the the uh, speaker is sitting. This is where the speaker pro tem is sitting, the majority leader. Uh, and there are different elements of watching what is going on off the floor. So uh, when you're in Sacramento and seeing what's going on, you would normally pay attention to what's going on up at the dais, what's happening in the action and, and what's happening uh, right there in front, behind the board that's recording the votes. 
But what you want to pay attention to is not just what's recording the votes. You want to pay attention to what's happening in the back of the chamber uh, for what's happening with negotiations and management of the floor. The speaker may not be there, but the speaker pro tem may be running things from the back of the chamber, if you will, or the majority leader may be whipping up votes from seeing the playing field, if you will. Think of them as like catchers on a baseball field. They're seeing the whole field, setting up the defense and kind of quarterbacking the team uh, in that sense. Uh, as, as you see this kind of going on. And, and we see a similar seating chart, even though it hasn't been formally noted yet uh, for the California State Senate. But in the past, we see similarly kind of this disposition uh, of difference by party uh, as well. Okay, so where to pressure, influence, and access, and what to pay attention to with the California legislature when thinking about this. You want to pay attention to those key standing and subcommittees. A key standing committee is often a committee that generates what we call juice or campaign finance or campaign donors. I know we love to hate money in politics, but uh, a juice committee is one that has uh, a very close relationship with uh, important interest groups. So when you look at a, a group like uh, BMP, what's called business and professions, uh, BMP, uh, an assembly committee, committee a Senate committee, uh, you see in business and professions, these committees that uh, generate a lot of juice because they deal with the insurance industry or they deal with uh, a business uh, community, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and there's a lot of bills that come forward. There's a lot of juice or campaign finance donations uh, that uh, are involved there uh, and a lot of pressure and access in those elements. But you also want to pay attention to those subcommittees, those subcommittees that involve appropriations, those subcommittees that involve budget to assess the players. Because those players on those committees, juice committees, a committee like governmental organization that deals with all the sins, right? Uh, beverages, uh, that deals uh, with gaming, that deals uh, with the issues that cross gaming and alcoholic beverages, uh, that might involve, for example, uh, even things related to insurance and auto insurance and liability and uh, things of that nature. That means that the leaders of those committees uh, that are generating juice are also hugely important to leadership. They're close to the leadership. So that means, again, the North Bay's influence, punching above its weight, is an important component here when you look at Mike McGuire in the state Senate and Bill Dodd, if he remains chair of the influential governmental organization committee. Uh, if you look at not just who's the leader of GO in relationship to the new pro tem, but you look at the new speaker and what happens in certain key committees if they think housing is going to be an important issue or a priority or what they're going to do about mental health because the governor has established that as a priority. So we see a lot of simpaticos, if you will, between key standing committee leaders and key subcommittee late leaders as the players in, in cahoots or close to the leadership in this element. So that means when you go to a page, uh, and I've linked to like a job ad here for a committee consultant uh, for one of the committees that was hiring, I think it was maybe an environmental committee. It gives you an idea of what people are looking for as a consultant in the committee. When you read that job ad, you'll see what their responsibilities are, what the expectations are, what the expectation is for quality or their role in a gatekeeping because it is these committee consultants that have been around forever and know the ins and outs on the players. They know what the third house, that would be the lobbyists, they know what different interest groups are gonna to object to, what they're gonna write, what they're gonna say, and it is the committee consultants that help the committee chair and the members who sit on the committees, the analysis uh, to drive the analysis of a bill and what's influenced in that bill analysis, how costly it will be in terms of dollars, how costly it will be in terms of interest groups and what it does. So the committee consultants on a big juice committee are major staff players that have an important role working with legislative office staff as legislation is designed. And if you go to the websites of a committee, if you go to business and professions, or higher education, or you go to, uh, for example, a governmental organization, or you look at a budget subcommittee, you are gonna find experts who have been, quote unquote, in the building. They've been working in the legislature for a long time. They've seen a lot of members come and go, and they know the battlefield, and they know what the stakes are across multiple policy areas. And those committee consultants are a goldmine 
of information and help as you look at the legislative process. So I put here in all caps, know them and befriend them. Reach out to them. They know things that others do not because they also know which lobbyists are going to have which positions, who's going to be a contract lobbyist to work as a gun for hire, versus who is, versus who is a lobbyist who will uh, represent the interests of, say, telecom or tobacco because they've always worked for telecom or tobacco and they work directly for those uh, companies or not. They'll know essentially where the bodies are buried. So the committee consultants play a huge, huge role. One place they play an important role is as a bill after it's introduced and goes to first reading, moves forward to second and third readings. And it is from second reading where a bill is often amended into the third reading where a bill can be passed by a committee uh, and goes to the floor for a vote. When that happens, uh, before it moves to the next chamber, it's really hard after third reading to get amendments offered that the leadership is not aware of. So as you move from first reading introduction into second reading with amendments into third reading, as you it gets harder and harder to add amendments. And so if amendments are added, it's also a key indicator, a barometer of who's hugely influential to get that done because it's such a heavy, heavy lift. Which brings us to the role of legislative office staff. Almost all members now, even though they design their own budgets and are given a certain uh, allowance uh, to, for staff positions, and we've seen a push to unionize staffers in the legislature, uh, legislative office staff uh, that are involved in this particular element of the process is typically what's called the ledge director or the legislative director. Uh, this is uh, Logan Pitts, who's coming in uh, for uh, here in a couple of weeks to talk about how an idea becomes law. Logan has uh, a role as kind of a co-legislative director uh, in the office of Senator Bill Dodd. And as a legislative director or working with the legislative team, they know the ins and outs of the process. They carry the legislative package for the member. And by carrying that legislative package with the member, they're able to push and understand what the third house interest will be. Uh, what the interests will be of the lobbying community, the community that's representing various interest groups. And there will also be elements here of working with the COS or the chief of staff. So as you look at committee consultants, you also want to ask the committee consultant, who do they deal with? Uh, are they dealing with the ledge director or are they dealing with the chief of staff? And the example I'll draw to you is this. With a new member, uh, like Assembly Member Comley, he may have a legislative director, but his chief of staff, because he's new, he's going to rely on that chief of staff quite a bit to coordinate deeply with the legislative director and with committee consultants. So if you're uh, trying to make a play for a position or you're trying to make some influence uh, about a piece of legislation, you want to talk to the chief of staff much more than you want to talk to the legislative director. Ideally, you want to talk to both. But what that does is it gives you an element or an opportunity to influence that new member while you're building up uh, their team as well and always consulting with that committee consultant. <clears throat> now, I also put on here uh, elements of how to find information on bills to track uh, different different uh, elements of the bill and how it changes. So maybe you know the bill, maybe you know the author, you can use the ledge info, but what happens if it's a bill that's passed uh, and you wanted to know how a member voted and you wanted to know uh, what were some of the votes that occurred on the floor? Uh, you would use the, the second uh, URL. And if you know the author of the bill, you can also look at the wonderful guide at the UCLA School of Law and uh, the bill tracking for free for federal and state bills, that's at USF uh, at, uh, as well. It's the UCLA School of Law and USF School of Law, what they have going there for those federal and state bills. If you have a little bit more information than what is required for Ledge Info, Ledge Info will give you information about past legislation. Ledge Info will allow you to look at current ABs, assembly bills, or current Senate bills. But if you want to know, if you just have the author of the bill or you want to check what's going on more broadly, the bottom two URLs are particularly helpful uh, as well for, for grabbing information, getting bill history, getting vote history, and kind of digging down, if you will, a little bit deeper, but also kind of standing back and understanding the playing field uh, of what's happening uh, relative to the Ledge Info websites. That means you got to pay attention to legislative deadlines. And I've highlighted these, put these into bold, 
and I'm going to show you uh, an example of this. I think it's just going to be hard to see in our computers here uh, related to legislative deadlines. There are certain legislative deadlines that occur annually and over the two-year session for how bills can progress. And those are really important. And it's, the, uh, it's folks that don't pay attention to these legislative deadlines or offices uh, in the legislature or in the third house that don't pay attention to these legislative deadlines or don't understand them uh, where really uh, bad things can happen. So it's the legislative deadline schedule based upon the legislative calendars that looks like this. It's these California legislative calendars that run the same for both the Senate and the Assembly and have key dates attached to them. Some of these involve when a policy bill can move forward, when a bill has to be passed out of a fiscal committee so it doesn't receive uh, a hearing and it, it's going to give out money. If it doesn't get past that fiscal committee, then it can't advance or move forward. Uh, uh, opportunities for the last day for a bill to be amended or last uh, day for a bill to be changed, last day for a bill to be even introduced for what is going on. Because what we have seen in the last couple of legislative sessions are a huge number of bills from a very productive caucus, uh, caucuses going on. So the last, say, four or five years, uh, especially under the uh, time in which Governor Newsom has been governor, there's been a lot of bills going to his desk. Uh, doesn't mean he's signing all of them. There's uh, the veto uh, numbers have also gone up uh, over his tenure as governor. But nonetheless, there's a lot of key dates in the California legislative calendars to even get things considered. So if you know who the players are and you know what the dates are, that would be a, 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 an important component. And you want to know what the schedule looks like. There's a Senate daily file and there's an Assembly daily file. I gave you the Assembly daily file because the uh, Senate daily file is still being worked out day to day as the new pro tem and his team kind of come on board and get their feet under them. So as you look at the assembly daily file, it, it is available online and it is printed by uh, the assembly or by the Capitol printing office in the bottom in the basement of the legislature. And you can go and get the daily file and it'll give you what is going on for the legislature on a particular day. You get it in a hard copy, you can get it online and it tells you day to day what's going on for say Monday, Tuesday, it tells you what committees are meeting. It tells you what's on the agenda. It doesn't tell you uh, deeply uh, what's going on there, but it does tell you the room, does tell you who the members are of the committee, and it does tell you the business that will be before them. So if you're ever in Sacramento and you want to know what the Okay, as you probably can tell, uh, David McEwen has been frozen. Uh, so we're trying to work on it. If you can just hold on, thanks so much. Hi everyone, I'm back. I'm back, I apologize, I'm not. Yay. Hope we're okay. You can see that screen. Okay. Yes. Can you please put it in the slide? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I will. I will. Thank you. Yes. G give me a, yeah, Jimmy, just one second. I have to just yeah. move it on the, there we go. All right. Uh, I apologize for that. Did we, did we end with uh, the daily file? Is that where we were at? Yes. Okay, great. I just want to remind you that if you, 
Uh, again, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, if you look at the daily file, this gives you the day-to-day -day of what's happening. It tells you where the players are at. You want to pay attention to the size of the committee room for where those committees are meeting. Big committee room, usually important, usually a juice committee. Small committee room, uh, they're doing things that often aren't too earth-shattering. So when you go to Sacramento, look at either the daily file online for the Assembly or the Senate, or go down to the basement and get the printed copy. All right, let's talk about direct democracy in California. Direct democracy in California is that kind of often referred to as the fourth branch of government. So you obviously have the, uh, the assembly and the Senate, you have the executive branch, you have what's going on in the judicial branch, but it's this fourth branch of government, this direct democracy in California, that's an important element uh, of our politics. There are certain rules governing this and what this looks like You can, about qualifying a ballot measure in California particularly ballot measures that are initiated by voter petitions or those initiated, uh, whether that be for a constitutional amendment, a CA, or an initiative statute, an IS, or a combination of an IS uh, and an ICA. That's an, another important element here. And they should be, sub, uh, they are subject to what's called the single subject requirement. The problem with the single subject requirement, if it's, it's a ballot measure related to, say, taxes or uh, a fiscal measure, it's often not technically just a single subject. So the single subject uh, requirement often gets uh, changed uh, quite a bit. There's obviously the referendum process, uh, which can be uh, involved a compulsory referendum where uh, a measure is passed by two thirds of the legislature and then referred to the citizens. This is most uh, commonly seen as state bonds and constitutional amendments that come from the legislature or a petition referendum where a law has been passed by the legislature signed by the gover governor and say an interest group wants to bring that forward uh, as an opportunity for people to vote on. We've seen this more recently with attempts to overturn uh, what's going on with flavored tobacco uh, and, and other uh, elements uh, as well. And then obviously the recall effort. Uh, the recall about removing a, an official from office has been on the ballot in California for some time. It has only been used a few times to, to move forward on the governor uh, in, in a success, meaning it's qualified. There have been several attempts, attempts to do this. And we are in the process of changing how we do recalls, uh, providing for uh, if the governor is recalled, that the lieutenant governor uh, will take the seat of the governor. Uh, in the past, it's been uh, a replacement candidate, and that process uh, is now going to change, where uh, if the governor is removed, the lieutenant governor would, would take that position. There have been some important historical changes in the California initiative process. I put those in the talk, but really what I want to draw your attention to is not the advent and rise of the California uh, initiative process from 1910 to 1911, or uh, the movement of it to $200 in 1943. But in 2011, Governor Brown signed a bill which ended the practice that began in 1960 of ballot measures being on the June primary election and has moved everything to the November ballot. And what this has done is twofold. One, it has increased the cost of what goes on the ballot. And what I mean by that is not the qualification cost of $2,000. If everything moves to one ballot, the ballot in November has become hugely expensive and deeply, deeply controversial for what's on the ballot. And yet, ironically, the passage rate of ballot measures has gone up since that time. The general rule is about one in three ballot measures passes in California. Two out of three go down. But since 2011, and when this bill uh, took effect in, in 2012, the ballot measure rate of passage has gone up over 40%. It's gone up dramatically since that time, while campaigns themselves and ballot measure campaigns have become much more expensive. So it was designed as a way to move the fights out of June into November uh, to concentrate uh, just on November. But in point of fact, it's led to more expensive ballot measure fights and the passage rate that's uh, interestingly gone up from what we've seen historically in the past. This is an analysis uh, that we do together working with the league of what's happened to ballot measures in this parallel legislature. And as you can see, the number that have been proposed has gone up dramatically, especially uh, since Proposition 13 or in the 1970s and 1980s and so forth. But the number has recently come down, especially in the last couple of years. We saw a tick up in 2020, 2022, and we anticipate this fall that there will be more than a dozen measures on the ballot and that campaign finance spending, uh, campaign finance raising and spending 
will total over a billion dollars. Just the attempted recall of Governor Newsom in 2021 cost about $450, $440 million in terms of money that was raised, in terms of administration of that recall. So the parallel legislature, the fourth branch of government, has become a big, big deal in terms of policymaking and in terms of campaign finance uh, in, in California. Here's another way of looking at uh, these California ballot initiatives and what's happened in terms of approval, qualification, and proposal. The same thing you saw before, just uh, expressed uh, a different way with some data for you to examine. So a, lot's get a lot gets proposed, fewer things get qualified. There's a lot of things out there in terms of qualification attempts now, and, and very little gets approved. If you looked at the history of the process, not from 1999, but since 1911 to 2020, 2022, what you do see is that uh, the ballot measure process, about 7% of measures that are proposed, qualified, and approved, run it all soup to nuts, about 7% uh, get approved. About one in three that qualify for the ballot are actually approved when you look at it that way. There's a lot of ballot measures uh, that we've seen. November 2022, it was the most expensive election ever. Well, at least until what we're likely to see in 2024. This is just to give you an idea uh, of those uh, elements that came on the ballot that you might recall from November 2022, a referendum on the flavored tobacco, uh, a, a measure related to reproductive freedom because of what was happening around reproductive rights, the gaming measures uh, for 26 and 27 and so forth. And you look at contributions and what happens, just as a reminder, whether we're looking at 2020, 2022, or into 2024, that ballot measures in California involve hundreds of millions of dollars of campaign fundraising and campaign spending. They're the second most expensive elections in the, in the free world. Only the U.S. presidential election involves higher rates of campaign fundraising and campaign spending. Uh, this is, it's nothing, it, 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 it makes a Georgia Senate race or it makes a California legislative race uh, seem like peanuts compared to what goes on in the ballot measure process. So like the legislative process that involves a lot of interests and clash of dollars and influence, the ballot measure process similarly has the same thing going on. Just in November 2020 alone, we saw over three quarters of a billion, of a million dollars, almost three quarters, almost a billion dollars, three quarters of a billion dollars, pardon me there, was spent in November 2020 alone. Stem cells, voting rights, rent control, kidney dialysis for the third time, consumer privacy, zero bail, controversial and deep policy issues on the ballot measure where involved three quarters of a billion dollars in November 2020. Lots of fundraisers and donors, like on Proposition 22 with Uber and Lyft, like Fresenius and DeVita on kidney dialysis, again, the third time around. And then we occasionally see ballot measures like 17 and 18 that didn't have any dollars spent on them. We monitor this uh, as well, and it's just something for you not to forget. All right, let me just, uh, before we go to Q&A, I do wanna talk to you about the rulemaking process and another element here uh, related to what happens uh, in California's kind of uh, demographic change. The rulemaking process after the legislature passes a bill where they develop rules and create supporting documents and hold public workshops and meet with stakeholders about how to implement a new law. I've circled these elements in red here. All of them have public workshops and public comment periods where if you are an expert or have a particular interest in how a rule is developed to comply with a state law, a piece of legislation has been passed and you want to deal with what it does in terms of education in your community or transportation or infrastructure process. Uh, process. The rulemaking process, in other words, your influence as a citizen, uh, as an interested party, as a subject matter expert, does not stop at the legislative process and when the legislature or a bill has been signed because the rulemaking process provides us an opportunity to have even further influence for the width or range of what happens in terms of compliance uh, with, uh, with a law through rulemaking. Rulemaking matters in a big, big way. California has over 200 state agencies, departments, boards, and commissions. It's uh, it creates the California Code of Regulations. What goes into that code is called rulemaking, and there are 28 different subject matter titles. 
that govern everything from, say, uh, barbershops and uh, stylists and hairdressers to what we do uh, ar around car safety in the state or what we do around uh, carb and, 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 and uh, pollutants, what we do around professional associations uh, for accountants or realtors or lawyers. So the rulemaking process can be an important inflection point to influence what is happening as well. And I don't want us to forget about that even after legislation uh, is passed. Also, there are differences between regular and emergency rules. Emergency rules are rules that can only exist in place for a certain period of time, 45 days or 180 days, depending. And those emergency rules are, are designed or developed to, a, to address emergencies or exigence uh, conditions that are going on. There's also a terrific long URL, but you can click on it, uh, that uh, simplifies the rulemaking explanation and what you can do at UCLA School of Law. It's very helpful for showing you, based on this graphic, where you can uh, influence an agency that's holding a public hearing relative to uh, standards provided for all sorts of areas across uh, those 200 agencies and those uh, 28 different uh, kind of rulemaking titles or sections of the California Code of Regulations. All right, to end tonight, before we get to your questions, I wanna just remind us of the effect of changes that are going forward given California's geography. The argument is that California is always this state uh, where counties that touch water are blue and counties that don't touch water are red as exemplified by this map. But there's a lot of things kind of going on under the surface. And I want to give you the opportunity to think about those and where you can get information about those as well. First, remember, California has multiple regions. It's a diverse state of 39 million people. And you've got a lot of people that are registered to vote. So there's a lot of clashing of interests. So when you look at things like this, that look at the regions of California, one thing to pay close attention to is not just the regions or the difference between the red blue divide that we hear so much about in the media, but where people live and how old they are. Because California's population is dramatically changing. And the, and the groups that are in school are coming to voting age. And it's that generation of who's coming next, who's 14 years old and maybe misses this election, but is in the 2028 election and is moving forward. And we know that voting is a habit so the interests of school age, particularly high school, junior high and high school age students and what they look like and what they're interested in and what they think about is important for the next election and generations moving forward. And their policy preferences are very different than what we see with California's traditional electorate that's been voting uh, ongoing, say, since 1966 in that professional legislature. It's also a bifurcation that we see going on between those that support one party or another it's not just between counties that touch water and those that don't. It's also a bifurcation of results between, say, north and south. So the state is very diverse in these interests, north and south, and reflects demographic changes. I always use a slide and point this slide out because that citydata.com county URL at the bottom allows you to see what's going on in your county and in your city with changes in income ownership, with who's moving, it allows you to get really at your community and to look at several different elements of how your neighborhood, your area is changing, particularly at the county and city level. So it allows us to get at several of these things to understand demographic trends that are driving a lot of our politics. One of those elements that is driving demographic change and that, or that based on demographic change have been changes in the parties. This is the 60 day report of registration currently available from the Secretary of State's office that shows about one in two California voters, 47% are registered as a Democrat, 24% as Republicans and 21, 22% it fluctuates in no party preference. And this is a big, big sea change, especially since, as I mentioned, uh, the recall of Gray Davis in 2003. Same data, just reflecting the numbers. There's a lot of registered voters in California. And even the independents in California tend to lean Democratic. So if we look at where people live and we look at what their leanings are, the, the NPP voters, the no party preference voters are also leaning Democratic. And the unregistered in California also lean Democratic. This has helped make the state bluer, but where it's really been important is at the local level. We've seen more Democrats type, uh, 
a registrants elected to local office, even though they're nonpartisan offices, and the type of Democrat is different. So we see a legislature that's more diverse with more people from local government, but at the same time, uh, it has been still difficult to see policy changes that are advancing in certain areas, something to just kind of pay attention to. So what this means is, mathematically, is unregistered Californians make Republicans more Demo Republican places more Democratic and Democratic places more Republican. So there's this bifurcation that's going on. This is just to show you the bifurcation uh, for what's happening uh, in terms of those registered and unregistered voters and how they lean. Places where voters are unregistered lean more Republican and places where unregistered lean more Democratic, just showing you overall kind of what that looks like uh, for voters. It's a little bit of a confusing table and I apologize for that, but it's to show you that even the unregistered voters have an important element or role in California's politics. We also wanna think about post COVID and how California is changing and what that looks like. And in the post COVID recovery, what's that doing to the economy of California? So there are different places you can go like at the EDD to get labor market information week by week for weekly initial claims, just to show you that there's a lot of potential budget problems uh, in terms of California's economic forecast, but weekly initial claims have been slowing down over the last year or so based upon the moving average. So while we did see a flattening out before COVID, we wanna look and see what's happening after COVID. And you can do that at the labor market info URL listed there. And finally, there are ways to forecast this from the LAO. We look at the big three revenue outlook. We look at PITS, personal income taxes. We look at corporate taxes and we look at sales taxes. California's PITS, personal income taxes. It sits corporate income taxes and it sits sales taxes. These three drivers of the economy, the big three they're called, also give us an idea about what the LAO, what the governor and what the legislature will be looking at for budget projections. Again, just reminding you that budgets and fiscal stress are really, really important to what's going on here. All right. Again, I apologize for us getting cut off there through our timing off a little bit, but I do want to get to your questions and your comments. So uh, let me stop the share and uh, maybe we could we could get to those here. Uh, let's see. All right. Karen, okay. thank you. Oh, sure. Thanks so much, David. That was great. Makes me want to be back in college. <laughs> uh, uh, Kep, uh, First of all, um, we will be sending out a resource list to everybody who signed up for this uh, webinar later on. And uh, there was a question about whether the webinar is going to be recorded and it is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube page. So um, a couple of questions uh, you already answered by uh, your uh, comments, um, but the there were two questions regarding uh, campaign or committee consultants. Yeah. One was, um, how do you find out who they are? Okay. And who? how do they differ from lobbyists and who pays them? Okay, great, great questions. All right, so if you go to a committee's webpage at the legislature, so let's say you go to the Committee on Public Safety. If you go to the Committee on Public Safety on the, the sidebar of the page, by design, by convention, they list the committee consultants or they'll put a, a link that says committee consultants that you can link on. It'll tell you who they are. And on some of the pages, but not on all of them, they provide both their email address and their phone number. On all the web pages, they provide one or the other. It just depends what the committee consultant uh, wants, but you can look at it on the committee's web page. The committee consultants are front and center, so they're available. And they're paid by their branch of the legislature. So that if they're in a, an assembly committee consultant, they're paid out of the budget of the assembly. And if they're a committee consultant on the Senate side, they're paid out of the budget of the Senate. So they're state employees, they're legislature employees. And, and so how do they have been around a long time. And how do they differ from lobbyists? Hmm. Thank you. They differ from lobbyists in that uh, they are prohibited by law uh, from uh, taking a position. They're supposed to be like nonpartisan arbiters. Uh, in point of fact, if uh, since the Democrats run the legislature, they are Demo they are more Democratic leaning uh, than not, but they're supposed to serve also the Republicans. The way it has worked conventionally for decades is that the Republicans generally use their own committee consultants out of their personal staff and leave 
uh, the committee staff to really on the Democratic side, but they are supposed to be nonpartisan and serve both sides of the aisle, if you will, and members. But they are not lobbyists and they are prevented from lobbying under term limits as members have left. And when the legislature's uh, budget was cut by 40 percent in the first term limit version in 1994, uh, they cut the budget by 40 percent. And all of the smart uh, seasoned veterans uh, who were committee consultants, they all left uh, and went and became lobbyists. That is something they do afterwards. There are some rules around that as well for how long they have to sit out, typically a year. Well, since you brought up uh, term limits, um, it seems like uh, term limits create musical chairs. And so can you talk a little bit more about term limits and the pros and the cons and if you yeah. ever think they'll go away? Yeah. OK, so there's a couple elements to this. One is there's been more recently uh, attempts to provide term limits at the federal level. And I just want to remind people that uh, at the federal level for Congress, term limits were declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, but they have been provided for at the state level. And there are a number of states that have term limits in one way or another. In California, we revised term limits in 2012 to take effect in 2014. And those revised term limits were not split. The previous allotment of term limits cut the state legislature by 40%. And it said you could serve uh, so many terms in this chamber and so many terms in that chamber. The musical chairs kind of analogy, uh, Karen, that you drew there. Under the current term limits law, the budget cuts aren't there, and, which is good because you want to keep those seasoned professionals like committee consultants, like legislative staff that have been around a long time. And the maximum amount you could time that you could serve is 12 years. So that 12 years could be 12 years in the assembly. It could be six terms. It could be three, four year terms in the state Senate, or it could be a combination, but the max is 12 years. That's why we see the full effect of term limits hitting after the 2026 election. Uh, in terms of the value of term limits, they do lead, they have led uh, to an increase in the number of people from local government and an increase in the diversity of the legislature. I don't think, uh, and scholars love that. We love a diverse set of interests. Uh, this is one reason we like uh, uh, district elections because we think it leads to diversity and better representation. It doesn't necessarily lead to better policymaking and we don't see evidence of that uh, as a result of term limits. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and another question is, uh, what are the, uh, what's the difference between a proposition and an initiative? Okay, so yeah, no, and let's let's kind of add this up. There's propositions, there's initiatives, there's initiative statutes, there's initiative constitutional amendments, and I went kind of quickly through there. Uh, propositions are a, and ballot measures, direct legislation and uh, direct democracy are all used kind of uh, s synonymously. So when we're talking about a proposition, we are typically talking about a ballot measure that is qualified as an initiative. That initiative could be an IS, initiative statute, it could be an initiative constitutional amendment, an ICA, or it could be both, an ICA slash IS. It, it, it does both, puts it in the statute and revises the California constitution. But when we're talking about a ballot measure or a proposition or an initiative, typically what we're talking about is something that involves signature gathering, has qualified and met those thresholds and has moved forward through that popular petition. $2,000 to file for title and summary uh, for, uh, Karen Weeks's birthday to be a paid state holiday uh, for all workers. Yeah. Uh, and we would go out and collect uh, title and summary uh, for that great day uh, to be out there. And as a result, uh, it would be a, a paid uh, state holiday for everyone uh, who, who's employed. Uh, and that would be collected through popular petition and then go and obviously passed uh, by all the voters. Uh, that would that's we're using proposition and ballot measure, uh, popular petition synonymously in that sense. The legislature can also move uh, forward uh, measures that alter the uh, constitution in particular and have California voters vote on those. However, it, it is often the case that ballot measures that come or those that are legislatively referred amendments, LRAs, legislatively referred amendments, uh, do not have the big campaign spending that I'm talking about. So the big ticket spending I was talking about in November 2020, November 2022, and this November involved those popular petitions. It's big money, uh, even though uh, it involves uh, the will of the people. <clears throat> Let's uh, stay on ballot measures. Um, and you talked about the passage rate uh, <clears throat> being high. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? 
Yeah. Uh, so the, the the argument is that the passage rate of ballot measures historically has about one in one in three, roughly. So the smartest money I'd argue to you in politics is to be on the no side of ballot measures. It's easier to move second. It's easier to block. And if you think about our politics today, that means it's easier to be against things than it is to be for things. So it's really hard to get things passed. Uh, and people often remark, you know, oh, the ballot measure process is out of control. And they say, listen, Prof, it's not what doesn't pass. It's what does pass and the unintended consequences of those things. It's the aftermath of term limits. It's the aftermath of Proposition 13 that matters greatly. Uh, that's hugely important. But also remember that the ballot measure process doesn't seem to be out of control. Uh, and there's some unusual things that do go on if we kind of look under the surface. So if we look under the surface, there is a lot of spending that goes on, just like there's a lot of lobbying that goes on in the legislature. It does not, uh, the ballot measure process doesn't seem to have the checks and balances, the give and take of those, uh, of, of those key committees and the movement of legislation uh, through uh, what we see in traditional lobbying or legislative process and lobbying. That's absolutely true. Uh, we, there used to be a process called the indirect initiative. We do use that from time to time. Florida uses that a lot. But if you start to peel back what's happening on the ballot measure process at the local level, what's happening with local school bonds, what's happening uh, with local ballot measures, local ballot measures pass at a much higher rate than what we see with state ballot measures. And, and that's uh, been perplexing and interesting. And, and people often worry about what happens with education, for example. But local school measures have passed at incredibly high rates over the last 15 years. Measures that haven't have involved at the local level, things like housing. Housing hasn't passed. Measures around public safety at the local level have passed at high rates. Parks and wildlife uh, measures don't just pass in Sonoma County. They pass overwhelmingly at the local level statewide. So there are some give and take about the ballot measure process. And then let me add one more element. The ballot measure process is also a, a place where we love to hate uh, and uh, love the process at the same time. This is a process where we have in the past in California picked on people because of who they are. Uh, we've tried to deny people rights. But historically, the ballot measure process is also the first place where women got the right to vote through a state, state vote. Uh, obviously important for the history of the league. It's the first place where we got rid of child labor laws. It's the first place where we got uh, rid and created anti-discrimination laws uh, against Chinese workers. Uh, so it is a process that both giveth and taketh away, just like uh, the traditional legislative process as well. Great. Well, um, this is probably going to be the last question. Um, what sources uh, are best for voters to go to to in order to find out who's providing financial contributions? Excellent uh, question. To both, both candidates and measures. Yeah. And I know you probably have a slide for that, right? Yeah. So, so th th that's a great, that's a great question. So, so let me, uh, let, let me, let me do something here. First, you, th there's election resources that we have that will provide to you like Cal Voter, like Vote 411. So in this particular question, Vote 411 is a good place to start for this, the person who asked this question. The Secretary of State's website also has this, but there are also places where you can look at money federally and at the state. And so let me give you one place. Uh, give me just a moment. Yeah, Vote 411 is a good place. And I wanna give you a place where you can go to find just that information. <clears throat> Give me just a second. I'm gonna share my screen here. If you wanna know what's going on, especially at the state level, this is the Secretary of State's website for campaign finance and lobbying activities. And we're really interested in what's called Cal Access. Cal Access. It looks like this who's giving money and what's going on. And you're really interested in this thing on the side, I'm gonna bring it down, called Power Search. I teach my students this, we do this in class. We work with the league on analyzing who's giving money and ballot measure democracy. We also do the same thing looking at candidates and who's giving money and who's backing them. And the Power Search click that's right here on the right side of your screen is really, really helpful for finding out what's going on for candidates, ballot measures, and who's giving. And this is what the quick search screen looks like. It's really, really helpful. So uh, thank you for your patience there and pointing this out.
but power search at the Secretary of State is really a goldmine of information for such a learned audience that wants to uh, really kind of uh, do their own digging for who's doing what. So Great, and that question. we, do, we yeah. do have time for one more question. And so that is, uh, when you talked about the various committees, there was the ethics committee. Um, <laughs> so what is yeah. your, what do they do? What's your opinion of them? How yeah. important it, is it? It just seems like, uh, as the as the person who asked the question said, it seems in today's world, it needs to be very active. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that question. And you notice I skipped right over it and listed it as a special committee. Uh, the Ethics Committee, uh, similarly to what we hear with the Ethics Committee uh, in Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., is the Self-Policing Committee uh, that looks at violations of uh, conduct and activity. And increasingly, uh, the Ethics Committees have been involved uh, with sexual harassment and discrimination uh, of of individuals in the building uh, in Sacramento, and that's been their uh, focus the last uh, several sessions for what's going on. It's comprised of members from both parties. It's designed to be nonpartisan, apolitical. It's designed to be self-policing. Uh, it, it is not considered uh, a, a desirable committee to be on for just these reasons, uh, but uh, I think it does open up a window into uh, what the legislature's uh, expectations are for behavior. And ha they have become, to the person's question, more active the last couple of sessions in terms of doing visible things and being more proactive. More trainings, uh, more kind of uh, webinars about what's going on and expectations of conduct and trying to uh, get ahead of the curve on certain things and to be more preventative as opposed to being reactive. Historically, it's been a committee that's been highly reactive and hasn't received uh, uh, that much activity or that much exposure. The, for the media and press, they pay close attention to what's going on before the agenda of the ethics committee to highlight some of those things to get kind of a pulse. And I would say, given the uh, tenor of the new leaders that we see in the in the Senate, state Senate, and in the state assembly, uh, they've uh, pledged to empower uh, the ethics committees to, to do better and be more proactive and not reactive. So it is, I think, a, a certain ways a barometer uh, of what's going on uh, with the members. Good question. Great. Thank you so much. Of course. We really appreciate you spending your time here. I know you have to rush off and do another uh, interview with me with the media. Um, and to all of our guests, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you haven't already, please register for the next two classes on February 20th and March 12th and sign up at lwvsonoma.org. At the League of Women Voters, we do democracy. So please come and join us. Thank you and good night.